This epic boss battle was made with 8 lines of code. Do you believe that? Well, in this video I will show you a secret technique using Grot animation system that will make your bosses come alive with professional grade behaviors and all of that using a simple visual interface. But before we dive into the video, <laughs> Happy birthday to me! <laughs> it's been a while guys and I think I never shared a birthday with you. With It's kind of strange, it's been like 9 years, almost 9 years and we barely speak to each other, right? Um, some of you guys actually became uh, real life friends of mine, but yeah, I I really hope that I meet, I meet more of you guys personally someday. Well, that's it. <laughs> Let's get into the video. The cake is amazing. <laughs> Just a second. Finite state machines are always a hot topic in the game development community, but people usually present some weird and over-engineered solutions for something that was supposed to be very simple. So simple, you can even implement it without coding, just leverage on Godot building features. The animation tree node is a powerful tool that allows us to blend animations and create state machines and to blend animations inside state machines, and to create state machines inside state machines. Now, why would you use the animation tree node instead of making our own node base or enumerator switch statement state machine? How does that work? Well, let's understand first what is an object state, then the state pattern, and finally, what are state machines so you understand why I use this specific approach. The problem with node base or enumerator base approaches is that most of the times you don't need that if you create good architectures that favor composition over inheritance. In these architectures, each component has its own states and manages them nicely, so you don't need to bundle everything into monolithic states. So, for instance, this is Ares scene tree. Yes, Ares the boss that I just showed you. So, you can see that there are a lot of components here, right? So, we have this dialog trigger, which triggers the interface passing the, the content of the dialogue, the music switcher, which changes the background music, some quests, which are components of the quest system, the event trigger, and this is perhaps one of the most important, important components here, the letter trigger, which will be what will tell the player if they can take a letter or deliver a letter or what's the content of the letter, and the event player, and this is the most important one, because the event player is kind of like a master a puppet master which will control all the components so you can see here that the event player has all the events that this um, this scene current has so it appears uh, when players challenge errors this is what plays when the combat it starts this is what plays when errors got defeated gets defeated this is what plays when players flee from the battle this is what plays so on and so forth so if you got interesting in how this event player works Stay tuned because by the end of this video I will, I will show you something really cool. But you can see that there are some other components. So for instance, I have this interactive area which controls when players get inside the interaction area of areas. So you can see that this code is very simple. It basically toggle on the unhandled input based on if the player is inside this area or not. And if the player presses a button, so the event button, the interaction, the interaction button, the interaction action, uh, it emits a signal which in this case will tell the event player to play an event. So depending on the current game state, it will allow it it will either tell the event player to play the combat uh, event or the introduction event or the letter delivering or the letter receiving event based on the, the game itself. And this is also controlled by the event player itself. So when you defeat areas, it will trigger some other stuff that will change what is the event that the interaction area will trigger when players interact with areas. So this is how it works. And if you manage to master how to favor composition over inheritance, as I said, each component handles its own state. So you don't actually need to have like a monolithic state making changes to all of this component because each component is making changes, is mutating their own state. But <laughs> I talked a lot about states now, but I didn't say what are states, right? So let's understand what is an object state. Most people don't even understand what an object state is, and they usually associate it with the state pattern or even worse, with finite state machines. 
But an object state is simply the set of the values that all the properties of an object currently are. For example, if an object only has one Boolean variable, it can be on two possible states, right? So true or false. If it has two Boolean variables, it can be on four possible states. And you can start to see the problem when we talk about objects with float number variables or color variables or even worse, string variables, right? It can scale really quickly. It can get near uh, infinity. But most of the times, we don't want our objects to be into an infinite number of possible states. We would rather have them into a limited set of possible states. For instance, a traffic light. It has three possible colors, right? But we don't want it to be on any of the 16 billion possible colors. We want it to be on a limited set of colors and especially we don't want it to combine these colors. It must be on either color at a time. So it must be either on red or yellow or green. We don't want it to be on yellow and green. We don't want it to be on yellow or red or red and green at the same time. It should be on red or yellow or green. And for that, we can use the state pattern. In objector-oriented programming, most of the design patterns simply take an object feature and turn it into another object. And this is exactly what the state pattern does. It takes an object state, which is an, a feature of an object, and turn it into another object that we can pass around and mutate procedurally. So basically what we do is to create a superclass that is going to provide an interface to interact with subclasses. So for instance, providing a, an enter method, a, an exit method, and a transition method. And it also takes a context object, which is the object that you want to manage the, the state. And after that, you create subclasses that's going to represent each of the desired states that you want to handle. When mutating the context object from one state into another, we do what is known as a transition. These transitions are typically associated with some conditionals that once met will transition the object from one state into the next one. And here we may run into some problems. Without carefully managing these transitions, we may run into the case where multiple states are active at the same time, overlapping their behaviors. And this is exactly what this pattern is meant to avoid, unexpected overlapping between states. To fix that, we can use a finite state machine, which will handle these transitions. So so once a state asks to transit to another object, it will be deactivated using its exit method and the next one will be activated using its enter method. In this architecture, all the states are aware of all the other states so they can transit between each other and also of the finite state machine so they can ask the state machine to make its magic. But also they are aware of the context object because, well, all of these classes were supposed to be part of the context class Cold, but we extracted them into standalone classes. I think that at this point you already understand how all of that works, right? But just a reminder, a summary. A state is the current set of values from an object's properties. The state pattern ensures that all of these, or some of these, are deterministic and we can transition between one state and the other. The finite state machine will ensure that when we do these transitions, there won't be any overlapping between states. But you might be asking yourself, how do we do that with animations and the animation tree? Well, <laughs> let's get back to areas. Well, animations are nothing but states, and using the animation tree, we can create a state machine that will control the transitions between these animations, ensuring that they won't overlap. The secret, though, is to use advanced expressions to create the conditions that should be met in order to transition from one animation into the other. An advanced expression is like a GDescript code snippet. It's really awesome. As long as the code you put there returns either true or false, it will work. Advanced conditions will access the node set in the advanced transition node property in the animation tree node. So you can create really interesting transitions, like checking if the character's life is above 30% or if there are errors overlapping with its site error. But in this case, I decided to use a variable in the errors node to control these transitions in a simpler way. I called it state. And based on this property, the character will transition between animations. The coolest thing is that it can even transition to another state machine, creating a multi-layered state machine. I use that to transition from the idle state to a combat substate, 
And within this combat substate machine, I made another one that blends two animations to create this animation where Ares spills some explosive bullets. Some of these animations don't even need a condition to transition to the next one. For instance, when Ares finishes his charge animation, he disappears, teleports back to the center of the boss pit, reappears and then starts the other animation again. To add a layer of uncertainty, from the idle animation Ares can either charge or spill some bullets. To control that, I use a conditional statement in Ares code. And well, this is the whole code that controls these state conditions. Less than 8 lines of code. The aim method just flips the sprite to look at the target and the charge method moves the boss towards the target using a twin animation. This conditional reposition Ares when he disappears and this block just makes sure that he will be stunned for 3 seconds if he hits something. Then he moves back to his disappearing and reappearing cycle. The signal callback method here just plays a hit flash animation on the sprites when Ares gets hit by something. Guys, most of what you just saw is only possible because I've used several recipes that I've been perfecting <laughs> throughout the years to create reliable systems for my games. The hit and hurt areas are the core of this combat system. Bullets, for instance, are hitboxes. Ares head enables and disables a hitbox based on the charging animation. The even player is what ensures that all of the dialogues quests and battle choreographies will happen in a chronological order. The interactive area ensures that players can interact with Ares, triggering its dialogues and the battle events, and much, much more. And you can find all of these recipes in my books. And to help you become even better at designing and implementing systems that allow you to make great games, I'm making a special offer that will help me found some toys, dippers, and other stuff for my soon-to-be-born son. Yes, guys, I'm going to be a father very, very soon. You can acquire two of my Godot Essential Recipes cookbooks and enroll for the first life to first dollar, which is a course that will help you design, develop, and launch your first game for $50. This offer will end as soon as my baby boy gets delivered on Earth. It's more than 50% discount on this bundle, but you can also purchase individual items at 50% discount as well. With over than 380 sales just on itch.io, the Platform Essentials Cookbook is a success, maintaining a perfect 5 stars rating. Top 7 Godot Recipes, my first book, also maintained a perfect 5 stars rating through 200 sales. And over than 50 people are enjoying a complete game design and development training in the first line to first dollar community, engaging with each new chapter I launch on the platform. Leverage my 10 years of experience making games with Godot Engine today! Check that link in the pinned comment and get this bundle. Oh, I have something to say, the first line to first dollar has limited seats because Notion only allows 100 people per workspace, so hurry up before we run out of slots. In this video, we explore how to create a boss battle system using Godot's engine animation tree node without writing complex code. We saw what are object states, what is the state pattern, and how we can make state machines, and how all of these relate to game development. We saw a practical demonstration using Ares, the first boss of my game, and we use animations as states and the animation tree as a way to manage the transition between these states. We also saw the power of advanced expressions, which allow us to create sophisticated conditions for animation transitions with minimal code. With this approach, we implemented features like combat states, blended animations for special attacks, and conditional transitions for animations, and all of that while keeping the system simple and maintainable. If you like this video, subscribe to the channel as I love to talk about game design and easy approaches to implement features in our games so we can focus on making the game instead of the implementation details. Also, don't forget to leave a thumbs up as this will tell YouTube that this is a valuable learning resource and it should spread it to other people. This will help me achieving my mission of helping people making the games they dream of. Oh, by the way, one of the recipes I used to create those asteroids that you saw around Ares and the bullets that Ares shoot and a lot of other things in this project is the spawner recipe, which you can learn how I made it in this video right here. So this is a personal recommendation. But that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Keep developing and until the next one. I hope you enjoyed.